We are, welcome back. Sorry, I was having a little bit of um, audio issues. Welcome back, or just welcome if this is the first time you're listening to one of these um, uh, videos, presentations, whatever. This is unit 11, testing and individual differences. And this goes along with Meyer Psychology for the AP course, third edition. These are the lecture notes that go along with it. Um, we are doing module number 61 today, which is assessing intelligence, a topic um, that used to be a primary function of my previous job when I was a school psychologist. So the learning targets for this module are to be able to describe the characteristics of an intelligence test and distinguish between the concepts of achievement and aptitude tests, discuss when and why, IQ tests were created and explain today's tests differ, how tests differ from early intelligence tests, like the differences between the ones that were created in the earliest 20th century to now. And also kind of remembering a little bit about some of our basic stat stuff we touched upon within the research methods unit. Understanding the concept of the normal curve, uh, standardization, which may be a more of a new term that you're going to be hearing, reliability and validity. So what is an intelligence test or an IQ test? It's a method for assessing an individual's mental aptitudes and comparing those with those of others. So it's kind of really trying to get at, you know, the aptitude, what someone is capable of and see where that person kind of compares to others within a population. So psychologists classify intelligence tests as Either achievement tests intended to reflect what you have learned, most people don't, most of the time that isn't what we're talking about in terms of intelligence tests, or aptitude tests intended to predict your ability to learn a new skill. So achievement tests are exams covering what you've learned in this course. So, you know, taking the AP exam will be an example of an achievement test or just even your regular unit exams or whatever you take in your particular course. Examples include, again, the AP test or chapter test, any sort of courses you're taking in any of your classes where you're learning material and then being tested on it. Those are achievement tests. So an aptitude test is like the call a college entrance exam, which is trying to be more predictive about how you'll do. This is um, like the SAT or the ACT trying to predict how um, you might perform in your in your future college experience or within a future job. So let's think a little bit. Research indicates that there is a strong positive correlation. Remember, po strong positive correlation means as one variable, the, the, the um, value of one variable goes up, the value on another variable goes up. So research indicates that there's a strong positive correlation between SAT scores and intelligence scores. So generally, the higher your intelligence is, the higher your SAT score is. But it's not, as you can see here, it's not perfect correlation. Um, and there are other things that um, are, are at play there. Many consider the modern SAT to be more of an achievement test, right? Measuring things you've learned rather than completely um, being uh, a measure of uh, your abilities in some way. So there are lots of things that also come to play in terms of in, uh, intelligence tests versus SAT. SAT you're usually doing a lot of prep for. Um, uh, and you know you definitely have had classes that will help you on those tests, whereas IQ tests are supposed to be a little bit different. They're supposed to be getting at your underlying abilities. Um, rather than your achievement. So one, one big thing to, to note about this particular module is you should, be, you should be familiar with some of the key contributors in terms of intelligence testing, like Sir Francis Galton, Alfred Binet, Louis Terman, David Wexler. Uh, those are really important names to remember uh, in terms of intelligence and intelligence testing. So a long time ago, uh, English scientist Francis Galton was fascinated with measuring human traits. And I believe he's, he was actually, Francis Galton was the one who was related to Charles Darwin. So um, he had some influence from Darwin, I believe. 
Um, Galton wondered if it might be possible to measure natural ability, right? Not just what you've learned to sort of measure what you're capable of and to encourage those of high ability to mate with one another. This is called this concept of eugenics. And it, if it sounds kind of creepy, it kind of is. Um, so, but this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to figure out, you know, who are the smart people and what can we do to encourage those who are people who are really smart to sort of have children together. Um, he devised methods to measure intellectual strengths based on things like reaction time, sensory things, sensory acuity, muscular power, and body proportions. Now, his quest to measure underlying ability, simple intelligence, it failed. Um, because what happened is the measurements that he thought would go into measuring intelligence, they didn't really end up correlating with intelligence. Galton did, however, leave the field of psychology with different statistical techniques that were really helpful, um, and the phrase nature versus and nurture, and the belief that there is an, uh, you know, a big genetic component, component of intelligence and being a gene, genius. So Alfred Binet was a French psychologist who was commissioned by the French government to design fair and unbiased intelligence tests to administer to French school children. They wanted to figure out who were the kids that needed, uh, might need some additional, you could additional help at some point. Um, Benet and his student, Theodore Simon, began assuming that all children follow the same course of intellectual development, but that some develop sort of more rapidly than others. And they use different terms we use now. And a dull child was thought to score much lower, much like a typical younger child and a bright child like a typical older child. And again, these are terms that we don't really use um, at this point, but they're terms that Benet and Simon would have used. Thus, their goal became measuring each child's mental age, the level of performance typical associated with a certain chronological age. So what was meant by mental age? So Benet assumed the average nine-year-old has a mental age of nine. Children below average mental ages, such as nine-year-olds perform, who perform at the typical level of a seven-year-old, would likely struggle with nine-year-old homework or schoolwork. Although the child had a chronological age of nine, Binet would say um, that child had a mental age of seven. So to measure mental age, Binet and Simon theorized that mental aptitude, like athletic aptitude, is a general capacity that shows up in a few different ways. They tested a variety of reasoning and problem-solving questions on uh, Binet's own two children, two daughters, and then on sort of very bright and sort of what they called backward Parisian school children. Items answered correctly could then predict how well other French children would handle their schoolwork. So what happened after that um, was that a Stanford University professor learned of what Binet was doing and he modified Binet's test, Binet and Terman's test, um, not sorry, Binet and Simon's test and um, brought it to the United States, brought it to California. And he modified the test for use as numerical measures of what of inherited, in, inherited intelligence. So he adapted some of Binet's original items, you know, making them more appropriate for the American population, added others, and established new age norms. Terman extended the upper end of the test range from teenagers to superior adults. Terman also gave his revision the name that still the test, the original test still holds. It's called the Stanford Binet. And this is a test I administered all the time when I was a school psychologist. At that point, it was in the fifth, fifth revision, it was the Stanford Binet 5. I'm not sure if there's a Stanford Binet 6 now, likely. For Terman, intelligence tests reveal the intelligence with which a person was born. So Terman took the focus rather than just measuring which children might need help in a particular school setting, he wanted to adapt the test to really become a measure of sort of inherited ability, going back to Francis Galton's original ideas about how we could show um, who had underlying um, genius, so to speak. So from the tests, German psychologist William Stern, and he might have been one I forgot to mention on one of the previous slides about one of the really important names, derived the famous term 
intelligence quotient or IQ, which I'm sure many or most of you have heard of. The IQ is simply a person's mental age divided by chronic chronological age and multiplied by 100 to get rid of the decimal point. So IQ is defined as the ratio of mental age, MA, to CA, chronological age, multiplied by 100. So on contemporary intelligence tests now, and this isn't the way we do it anymore, but this is originally how it was done. On contemporary intelligence tests, the average performance for a given age is assigned to a score of 100. And this goes from us all intelligence tests now, that an average score is considered to be 100. So what were the limits of IQ calculating? Well, the original IQ formula, that um, chronological mental age one, worked fairly well for children, but not for adults, right? It didn't really make sense for adults because the difference between someone who's 40 and 30 isn't the same as the difference for and what they know isn't the same as the difference for someone who's like 10 and five. So they had to recal recalibrate how the IQ was calculated. Most current tests, including the Stanford Binet, no longer compute IQ in that original manner. <laughs> you can see the meme here. That's my boy, Mark. He's 39, but he's already reading at a 42 year old level. That doesn't make sense, right? Even though there's three years difference, you're not really going to expect a 42-year-old to be reading much differently than a 39-year-old, um, I don't think. So interestingly, the military decided to use the intelligence test. With Terman's help, the U.S. government developed new tests to evaluate both newly arrived immigrants and World War I Army recruits. The world's first mass administration of an intelligence test, the Army Alpha and Beta, the version for illiterate or non-English speaking recruits was the beta. Tests were intended to measure verbal and numerical abilities, following directions and general fund of information or general knowledge. To some psychologists, the results indicated the inferiority of people not sharing their Anglo-Saxon heritage. So this is one of several ways that uses of intelligence tests a long time ago were used for, you know, not such great purposes. And because of the history of intelligence tests, while they've helped us in a lot of ways, a lot of people have very negative um, connotations of what they are because of the history of how they were used in the past. So sweeping judgments based on intelligence test scores became an embarrassment to most who championed testing. Lewis Terman even came to appreciate the test scores reflected not only that underlying genetic mental ability, but also you know, some environmental things, uh, education, native language. Of course, you know, testing people in English that didn't speak English, that's not really gonna give you a good indication of what their underlying intelligence is if they don't understand the test itself. But that was done, that was done quite often and done with some pretty nefarious intentions as well. Um, and just even familiarity with culture and the testing experience, all these kind of things play, play a part in intelligence testing. So abuses of those early intelligence tests, such as an immigrant screening, you know, they were actually used with, um, at this, you know, coming into Ellis Island to keep people out of the United States. So they remind us, these abuses of intelligence tests early on, remind us that science, even though they were trying to do things in a scientific manner, can be very value-laden. You know, people were doing things based on their beliefs about immigrants. So what intelligence tests did David Wexler design? So David Wexler created what is probably the most widely used intelligence test, the, um, the Wexler scales. There's an adult version, the Wexler adult intelligence scale, which is called the WACE. There's the WISC, which is the one for children. And then there's the WIPSI, which is the one for younger children. Usually goes, I think it still goes up to like ages six, um, six years, 11 months, I believe. But, and that's an example right there. And that picture, that woman, of a subtest called block design, where you would see a picture of, you know, some, uh, a whole design, and you'd have to use the block to try to recreate the picture. That is a very famous test on the Wexler scales. It is supposed to be a fairly good measure of G. If you remember from our previous module, if you listened, that whole idea of general intelligence. Block design would be one test that correlates pretty strongly with the concept of G. So again, there's block design right there, but what's, what are some of the other subtests? So recognizing similarities, like how do two words 
how are they related? You know, how are, how um, does one word relate to another word? Vocabulary, just a strict understanding of what words you know, letter number sequencing. Um, and again, this block design one is one that's a really uh, popular test to be, to be utilized in intelligence tests, especially the Wexler scales. So the WACE yields not only an overall intelligence test score, as does the Stanford Binet, but it gives you some sort of other scores for verbal comprehension, perceptual organization, working memory, and processing speed. Striking differences among those individual scores can kind of give you clues as a psychologist of cognitive strengths or weaknesses. So for example, a low verbal comprehension score combined with high scores and other subtests could potentially, and I want to preface that right there, could potentially indicate or reading or language disability. And this is a big part of what I did as a school psychologist. I administered lots of intelligence tests and achievement tests and all different kinds of tests um, to kids who were struggling uh, from anywhere from preschool through age college uh, through college age, kids who were struggling, and most oftentimes when I was doing these administrations of tests, there were kids who were struggling in the areas of reading or math, um, and we were looking for the presence of a learning, specific learning disability in one of those areas. So what three criteria must an intelligence test meet to be accepted? Well, it must be standardized, reliable, and valid. But what do those things mean? So standardized means to make scores meaningful, they are compared to pre-tested sample populations. So the Stanford Binet, the WISC, um, the KABC, the Woodcock-Johnson test of cognitive ability, to name four of probably the most popular individually administered IQ tests, those tests go through years and years of preparation and standardization before they're administered on the regular population, which is one reason why they're so expensive to buy. Um, and not anyone can buy them. You have to be a psychologist or maybe a, a physician is, or you, you can be a physician as well. Um, so to make scores more meaningful, they're compared to pre-tested sample population. So if you take a test, one of the, those IQ tests I just um, mentioned, your score will be compared to the standardization population. So how about reliability? So reliability means the test gives consistent scores no matter who takes it or when they take the test. Um, validity is the, does the test measure or predict what it's supposed to, to, supposed to? Is the test you're taking really a measure of intelligence and in, you know, how is intelligence defined? And they have all different ways of measuring that. Um, and, and all of these different IQ tests, you'll have a standardization manual that talks about the standardization population. It talks a lot about and how it's been tested on people from different regions, to people of different ethnicities, different, you know, different genders, that kind of thing. There will be standardization people that have diagnosed disabilities and those that do not, people that are, have been identified as gifted and those who are not. And they'll have reliability scores and validity scores to sort of give you the information that, that shows that is um, a, good, a good example to be used for a norm reference intelligence test. So the normal curve, this should be a review if you've been following along all of these um, modules. And um, this should be a review from our research methods course. So if a graph is constructed of test taker scores, if you, theoretically, if you take a huge amount of people who have taken an intelligence test, the scores will come out with about, with most people scoring around average, which is around 100. So you'll see right there, what this bell curve shows us is that 68% of people are thought to score between 85 and 115 on intelligence tests, like the Stanford Binet, the WIST, the KABC, the Woodcock Johnson, and so on. About 95%, so 95% of people score between a 70 and 130. So you can see on the outer edges, you know, below, 100, below 70 and above 130 are a little bit, you know, out of the norm. So in general, we use those score cut points for identification for different groups. So a score below 70 is often thought as if they have, um, if a person has a score on an intelligence test of below 70, in addition to 
difficulties with their daily life and adaptive functioning, those individuals are often identified as having an intellectual disability. On the other end, individuals with an IQ score over 130 are often, often qualified for um, gifted programs. Now, there are some different cut points depending on where you are, but in general, that is the most common cut point, an IQ score of 130 or above for a gifted program. So the bell-shaped curve that describes the distribution of many phys physical and psychological attributes, this is the normal curve. Okay, and it's not just so, it's, you see, it's not just psychological attributes. Lots of different things like height um, are thought to fall within a normal curve within really big part. If you look at big, large populations, that is what is theorized, that things fall out in a normal curve. That most people fall around that middle score, but then there are people at each extreme. So mo most fall, scores fall near average, average, and fewer and fewer scores lie near the extremes. What is a characteristic of a normal curve distribution? So that remember that in a normal curve, think back, think back, the mean, which is the arithmetic average, the median, which is the middle number, and the mode, which is the most frequently occurring number, they're all the same. They all fall at the center at a in a normal curve distribution. Another characteristic of all normal curves is that 68% of scores fall within one standard deviation of the mean, which is in that green right there. 95% of scores fall two standard deviations from the mean. And remember, standard deviation is like um, a statistical technique for, for measuring variability. And um, so how, how the scores are spread. So 95% of scores fall two standard deviations from the mean. As you can see, that's between 70 and 130. And then 99% of scores fall between three standard deviations from the mean. So on an IQ test, we would be thinking almost everyone would be falling between scores of 55 and 145. Now there are some exceptions, right? There are definitely, there are people below 55 and there are people above 145. What does the test score indicate? For both the Stanford Binet and the Wexler scales, a score indicates whether that person's performance fell above or below average and where they compared to other people. How is intelligence score derived using the normal curve? A performance higher than all, of, all but two and a half percent of all scores would again, get a score of 130. A performance lower than 97.5% of all scores earns an intelligence score of 70. So how do the tests remain standardized? To keep the average score near 100, the Stanford Banan Wexler scales and all of the scales um, are periodically re-standardized. The waste fourth edition was standardized on a sample who took the test during 2007, um, not that initial standardization that happened in the 1930s. And that just happened again with the, not that long ago, a few years ago with like the WISC, which is the, the Wexler scale for children, was standard re-standardized into the WISC-5 just a few years ago. So what's really an interesting phenomenon is the Flynn effect. It turns out that intelligence test performance has improved. And this worldwide phenomenon is known as the Flynn effect. And there's a really interesting TED talk um, by James Flynn, who's a New Zealand researcher who has done a lot of work looking into this Flynn effect about IQ test scores going up. Fascinatingly, the average person's intelligence test score in 1920 um, was by today's standards only 76. So that's, that's really a big, big, big difference. And there's lots of theor theorizing about why that be might be and life becoming more complicated and us being exposed to more things and just an ability to um, understand the concept of abstraction and, and that so much better than say our grandparents or great grandparents. Now, Oh, sorry, going back to the Flynn effect, what's interesting is in very recent years, whether or not this Flynn effect has actually stopped or is reversing. There's some information out there that perhaps within the last decade or so, this Flynn effect that has been so um, widely studied is now actually reversing. So what is reliability and how is it determined? So reliability is the extent to which a test yields consistent results and it can be assessed in three ways. 
So in terms of IQ tests, split half scores on two halves of the test are compared, oftentimes like even versus odd numbers. Alternative form, varying versions, like you take an A version or a B version of the test, or test retest, doing the same test um, at different points. And you have to, with IQ tests, you have to have them spread out a bit because there can be like an effect of retaking the test again pretty soon afterwards can improve your scores. Um, so you should never take an IQ test, you know, if you are in two different situations, one in a school or going to see a psychologist, you should never take the same test um, within a very short period of time. The higher the correlation between the two scores, the higher the test's reliability. Now validity, on the other hand, is the extent to which a test measures or predicts what it's supposed to. For example, if your environmental science teacher spent several weeks discussing global warming trends, then gave an assessment on that subject, the test would be valid if it contained questions on global warming trends. So what is the difference between content validity and predictive validity? So content validity is the extent to which a test samples the behavior that is of interest. For example, the road test for a driver's license has content validity because it samples the task that a driver routine, routinely faces. Now predictive validity is the success with which a test predicts the behavior it is designed to predict. For example, some academic aptitude tests can predict success in school at certain ages. And that's the purpose, if you think about it, of like the SAT, the SAT its purpose is to be able to predict your success in college or ACT. And um, to some extent it does, there's some uh, rather nuanced information about that. Um, but it's also a concern always of whether or not it's still predicting who will be successful in college. When can predictive validity yield little information? So consider a correlation between football linemen's body weight, usually pretty big guys, and their success on the field. Note how insignificant the relationship becomes when the range of weight is narrowed to 280 to 320 pounds. So there's little correlation with restricted range. When you, when you um, sort of lessen the range of scores, the predictive validity reduces. So as the range of data under consideration, that's what I just said, <laughs> narrows, its predictive power diminishes rather if you, than if you use the entire range of scores, you can see that there is a correlation, but when you restrict the range there's, to the higher ends, there's very little correlation. And this is pretty similar to what happens with SAT scores. Um, we are already, already to the learning target reviews. <laughs> um, so the first one was at the end of this module, you should be able to describe the characteristics of an intelligence test and distinguish between the concept of achievement versus aptitude tests. So an intelligence test assesses people's mental aptitudes and compares them with those of others using numerical scores. Achievement tests, on the other hand, are designed to assess what you have learned. And the SAT is an example of one that's trying to be more of one of those aptitude tests, but there's a lot of information suggestion that it's actually become more of an achievement test because it's testing what you have learned as opposed to um, the more famous intelligence tests like the Wexler scales, the Stanford Binet, the Kaufman, the Kaufman batteries, and the Woodcock Johnson test of cognitive abilities. So aptitude tests are designed to predict what you can learn, right? The WACE, the wet one of the, the Wexler adult scale is an aptitude test is the most widely used intelligence test for adults. And the WISC, which is the children's version of that is likely the most used one for children. Um, in the late 1800s, this, is, um, this, this target was discussed when and why intelligence tests were created. So in the late 1800s, Sir Francis Galton, who believed that genius was inherited, you know, par, par, uh, something that was genetically passed down, attempted but failed to construct a simple intelligence test. Remember, he tried to do stuff that was like related to sensory things or muscle mass, that kind of thing. His hope had been to identify those with exceptional abilities and encourage them to have kids. In 19, he, he failed in that attempt. Um, but he did come up with some really interesting statistical techniques to help measure um, uh, what would later things within psychology for sure. In France in 1904, Alfred Binet, who tended toward an environmental, that nurture explanation of intelligence differences, started the modern intelligence testing movement 
by developing questions to measure children's mental age and thus predict progress in the school system. Binet hoped his test would be used to improve children's education rather than to limit opportunities, which to some extent IQ tests were later used to do was to limit opportunities, which is really unfortunate. So when and why intelligence tests were created, how they differ from early intelligence tests. So during the early 20th century, century Lewis Terman, who eventually became really famous for his study of highly gifted individuals throughout several decades, um, he took the he took the Binet Simon scale to Stanford, revised it, changed it to make it more appropriate for the population, and termed it the Stanford Binet, which is the name that it still utilizes today. And Terman's idea was thoughts were that intelligence is inherited more so. He thought that more so than what Binet had thought. So Terman was more in line with Francis Galton's earlier beliefs about intelligence. So. During this period, intelligence were sometimes used during this period to so early 20th to mid 20th century generally, used to document scientists' misguided assumptions about innate inferiority of certain ethnic and immigrant groups. So in terms of the statistical stuff that goes along with intelligence tests, the stuff that you should know for this course, the distribution of test scores often forms a normal bell-shaped curve around the central average score with fewer and fewer scores at the extreme. Remember, there's gonna be a lot of scores that sort of cluster around 100 and fewer and fewer, you know, below 70 and above 130. Standardization establishes a basis for meaningful score comparisons by giving a test to a representative sample of future test takers. Reliability is the extent to which a test yields consistent results on two halves of the test or like when people are retested, that sort of thing. Um, it gives sort of you get consistent results if a score if a test has high reliability. Validity is the extent to which a test measures or predicts what it's supposed to measure, right? Is an IQ test actually measuring what we conceptualize as intelligence? A test has content validity if it samples the pertinent behavior as a driving test measures driving ability. It has predictive validity if it predicts the behavior it was designed to predict. And that is it. We are all done for today. Thank you for listening. Take care.